Thank you, Arthur. Bless you. Bless you. Hallelujah. Excuse me while I get all my bits and bobs sorted here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't Jesus amazing? I mean, he's just absolutely amazing. That's, that's why we're here today, because of Jesus. Because of what he's done, what he's doing, what he's going to do in our lives. And through us, to each and every one of us, this is a day, this could be a day of history. I'm not being hypey, I'm just telling you the truth today. This could be a day of history where God's going to do something amazing. I'd like to just make a few comments before I get into the, the heart of what I'm doing with you today. Um, firstly, I'd like to say a great privilege and honour for me to um, be here um, today and with the, the church here tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. I want to say about the um, slides that are going to come up behind me. Um, I realise the slides are both faint and the, the, the um, font is quite small in them. Uh, don't strain your eyes trying to read them. They are mainly for my benefit and not for yours. And I will uh, give you the relative parts. I'm going to be reading out various things and various texts that are relevant. So don't um, kind of try to focus in on that at all. You're all right there. Uh, the other thing I want to say to you is the teaching that I'm going to be bringing to you today, I, I haven't taught for 11 years. I taught it with uh, uh, people with a mission ministries in Perth. Um, 11 years ago to their youth, um, and that's a daunting prospect, believe me, when you're teaching people with a mission youth about the Covenanters, and uh, a lot of what I'm sharing today, what you'll see on screen today, is thanks to them, and I give them a hearty thanks for their faithfulness in serving God in our nation over the decades, while some of us were still doing whatever we were doing. I also want to ask you to bear with me today. I am totally out of my comfort zone. I am not normally one of these people who, you know, operate um, the, the, um, these things that are above my head. Um, let me see. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's new to me. Um, I have an on-screen clicker here. I have a laptop, which is for my benefit, to help me keep in line. I have my Bible. I've got my own notes to do. And uh, I am going to be working with the Covenanter profiles later on, so I'm kind of multitasking. And you ladies know very well, men don't multitask. So please be gracious uh, to me today. I want to say to you that I am here today and I stand a bit like Paul with much fear and much trembling. I am in no means an expert on this subject and many of you here may be much more qualified uh, than I am to actually stand here. But there's a couple of things I want to um, clarify of my reason for being here. Uh, I, it's not about nationalism, it's not about political, it's not about sectarianism. Um, I worked in Russia, I was a missionary in Russia for 11 years from 1990 to 2001. Had over 40 trips there, I worked with the persecuted church. And during the time I was in Russia, I was involved with a conference uh, where there was a man who was known for his missionary work into China. His name is Dennis Balcom. He's one of the most amazing men on this earth today. And my wife and I had the privilege of um, having lunch with him. And he gave me a book. It was called Lily Among the Thorns. He had managed to get this book translated. And I read that book and I read it um, over a period of time. It was challenging. Uh, one minute you're laughing, one minute you're crying. You didn't know it was so powerful about the lives of these Chinese believers. And then one day when I was home, I, was, I couldn't sleep one night and I went into my office and I was sitting there and I was just looking at my, um, my bookshelf and I saw this, this book. I inherited my wife's book as she inherited mine. I saw this book called Fair Sunshine. I never, many of you nodding your heads, you know exactly about that book. I took it off the shelf and I read that book in one night. It absolutely brought me to my knees. It just broke me. I live in Gatehouse of Fleet in the southwest of Scotland, Covenanter land as well as this being Covenanter land in the west here. And I read this book about Chinese believers Lily Among the Thorns, and now I was reading a book not about China, not about Russia, not about Iran or Iraq, but about Scotland. About the men and women who laid down their lives to give me the freedom to preach the gospel in this nation. And not just me, but you as well. This word's for you today. For you to take to heart and to put into practice. I, near, I live near Wigton, so I went and visited the Martyr's Stake. 
That book sowed seeds of the covenant movement in my heart. That's why I'm here. I'd also like to clarify my attire. Again, it's not nationalistic. It's not to be controversial. I love the kilt. I wear it often. I used to go and do weddings in Gretna as a kind of tent-making exercise. And besides, all this gear costs me more than my Mercedes that is outside. So I'm going to wear it as often as I possibly can. So please don't be offended that I'm in Highland gear. It seemed a good opportunity for me today to wear the kilt and fitting for the occasion. Amen. Thirdly, I'd like to say that the subject of the Kamenanters can be very emotive. So I don't necessarily agree with everything that was done in the name of the covenanting movement, but we must remember there were also people there who infiltrated and had other motives and other agendas who jumped on the opportunity of the covenanter movement. It doesn't take anything away from the monumental difference they made in our nation that has affected us to this very day. Arthur and I were having coffee the other day in Starbucks and he was telling me we were talking about the Ark of the Covenant. I remember how David tried to bring back the Ark and he put a fancy cart and he did all of that and it went completely messed up. Somebody died and he gave the Ark away and all sorts of problems. And then he inquired of God and he brought the Ark back to the house of God in the prescribed way. You are here this morning today because God is bringing the Ark back into the house of God in his prescribed way. Not Arthur's, not mine, not any movement, but his prescribed way. And this is going to imprint your heart. This could be a historical moment for you, for me, for our nation. And I believe this is the prescribed way. And lastly, these presentations would normally be done over a whole weekend, but for purposes, I've been praying and seeking God. And so I'm going to skim through a lot of this, and please forgive me for that. But I have to do it for the sake of time and the sake of emphasis. I'd also like to take a few seconds to thank Arthur and the Eastgate Church and all the staff for all the work and hard work and prayers they put into it. I want to thank all my prayer partners and sponsors, some of you who are here today. You keep us on the road. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Fraser Ogston, who's sitting there, who I am staying with just now. He's my host. And without him giving me somewhere to stay, I may not have been able to make it here today. So I give you thanks. You are all my unsung heroes. It is not about who stands on the platform. We are all in this together. Every single one of us, there are no prima donnas in the kingdom of God. There's only one king, and his name is Jesus. Amen. We are here to exalt Jesus. So in this mind, we will get to the heart and soul of my part today. So I want you to open your Bibles, uh, if you want to. Just going to read a verse, and then I'm going to paraphrase chapter 11 of Hebrews. Daniel 11:32 in the King James Version says this. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. That's the enemy. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Those who do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have the great faith chapter, the hall of fame. But that hall of fame, you know, it's not about these men, these women of faith were not extraordinary people. They were ordinary people with an extraordinary relationship with God. They had an extraordinary relationship with God. Look at the list. They were farmers, builders, shepherds, fishermen, all ordinary people. I remember hearing the preacher Rick Godwin, he was sharing about how his mentor, a Dr. Stephen Alford, famous Baptist preacher, had said to him one day, took him aside and said, Rick, I tell you something, you can be as close to God as you really want to be. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. You and I can be as close to God as you and I really want to be. The people who do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Not know about their God, not know all information, not know about the Bible, but know God and know the God of the Bible. What an amazing thought. I may never ever get to know my king or I know a bit about him. I never, may never get to meet him or know him, but I know the king of kings. I may never get to visit Buckingham Palace, but every morning I get to sit with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Someone sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Scotland, let me see. If you were born here, if you've moved here, if you've emigrated here, if you're based here, then you are part of what God is doing. You are part of Scotland. You are part of Scotland. 
We get all nostalgic about our identity, especially in the UK and in Scotland. And we talk about our identity. Do you know that Scotland is made up of four or five different people groups? The Celts, the Picts, the Scots, the Britons, and of course the Norse or the Vikings. That was then, that was at the beginning, but look at us now. We're Scots, we're all of the above. We're Africans, we're Romanians, we're Chinese, we're Tamil, we're Singalese, we're Ukrainian, we're Polish, we're Russian, because we've made our home in this nation. And I want to say to you here this morning, if you are here and you've made Scotland your home, you are welcome. You are part of the body of Christ and you are with us in this whole um, mission that we have to reach our nation. Amen. So we're not talking about just a unique culture or religion or background. We're a mishmash of all people groups. And God has brought us together to serve him, to reach our nation. Two years ago at Christmas, I remember I had four services in a week. And they were all different nations. There were Tamil, African, Scots, and Romanian. And for two of those services, the Tamil and the Romanian, I had my translator here in Glasgow and in Perth. Because some people have made their home here. And they're part, if you're from a different culture, color, creed, you're welcome, you're family. But I do believe this. I do believe that deliverance and salvation for Scotland is coming out of Scotland. That you and I, us here together, we are to reach our own nation. I value incoming missions. I was a missionary in Russia for, 40, for, for over 40 trips for 11 years. It's important. I'm part of the Billy Graham thing that's happening in June. I'm involved with it. I work with Revive Scotland and their USA teams that come over. And I support those who have a genuine heart and desire to reach the people of our land and come and serve God here. So those of you who have made Scotland your home, praise God. You are co-heirs, co-workers, co-missioned, and your family. Amen. Now I've got that out of the way. Amen. Praise God. The Lord. So, a timeline of Scotland, I'm skimming through this. You know, the gospel came to Scotland through a lot of the saints, you know, Saint, um, let me just see, hang on, I'll make sure that you guys are on the same page as I am. Uh, there we go, hang on, sorry, I'll go back. So, am I in the right one? Hang on. There we go, the Celts, the Picts, right, so. Then um, it was brought to us by St. Ninian, Patrick, Finbar, Columba, Mungo. But you know, there has been archaeological, my daughter's an archaeologist, by the way, my eldest daughter. And there has been archaeological proof that the gospel came to Scotland long before the saints brought it. Romans, different sites, they found like crosses and various things before any of the saints. But they were the ones who came apostolically to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to our nation. So in those days, what happened was it kind of split into two. There was the Roman church and there was the Celtic church. When, when I say Roman church, I want to emphasize we're not talking Roman Catholic church here. We're talking Roman church here that came from Rome and many of these people were godly people. But the Celtic had a different kind of emphasis. The Celtic was more of a missionary and apostolic holiness and and everything was, you know, it wasn't about Sunday services and about form. It was about every single day. There was a split that took place. As I told you, I'm skimming all this because where I'm going. There was a split that took place. And um, we see that Celtic Christianity sort of demised a bit. I believe a lot of that's coming back. And I don't mean the sort of dubious spiritual stuff that can be thrown in there. I'm talking about the apostolic heart of the true Celtic Christian. To reach out, to reach out to the multitudes that are all around us. So we jump ahead, and I'm jumping ahead many centuries into the 1500s and the 1700s. We had a reformation, which was pretty much brought about by this man, Luther, Martin Luther, in the 1500s. And as you, some of you may well know, he read a verse that the we are justified by faith, not by works. And that one verse turned him and the world upside down and Scotland upside down. 
Because the church being corrupt at that time was teaching about works and, and privileges and all the rest of it. And suddenly we were hearing, no, it's by faith, through grace. This is not works, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. And so the Reformation took place. It started in Europe. But very soon, one man picked it up. One of the most famous Christians in history, John Knox. John Knox heard the teaching of Luther and brought it back to Scotland and turned the world or our nation upside down. He was totally devoted to the Lord. But this caused a right ruckus in the whole religious world of our nation. And I'm sorry I'm skimming through a lot of this because I want to get into the guts of what the covenanters believed and what motivated them. But it caused such a religious turmoil that actually, suddenly, it was dangerous to believe the gospel. It was dangerous to believe in Jesus. It was dangerous to have a copy of the scriptures illegal. It was illegal to meet and to share the good news. And so we had the Reformation happening. And then after the Reformation, as, as it began to take shape, we have the National Covenant and Arthur likes to tell the story of, was it Geddes, the Lady Geddes, that threw the, she threw the, the stool at Greyfriars Church. And that one act of, whether you can call it madness or anger or just normal life, depending on how your home is. <laughs> Maybe you're used to your wife chucking stools at you. <laughs> I can see you laughing there, <laughs> nodding your head. But it started something. The covenant and suddenly there were, there were skins being prepared and dried and men and women from highest, from the highest. The Duke of Argyle was one of the first to sign it. But so was the lowly shepherd. Rich and poor, great and small, signed it. And the covenant began to take toll, began to move within a very short period of time. I think it was 300,000 people had signed the covenant. Many of them Ordinary people. Ordinary people. And my friend's going to talk about the covenant and more about that later on. I don't want to go into the Scottish National Co Covenant in itself. We're on to the covenanters. And so what happened is you had this, this new movement. The Reformation had taken, was taking place. It was splitting things right down the middle. It was making it difficult to be a Christian, to speak the word, to believe, to express your faith, to express the Bible. And that. Does that sound, sound familiar to anybody here today? This is why we're at this. I know this is history, but we're right back there again. We are. People are getting arrested for preaching the gospel. People are getting arrested for saying... You know, oh, you're a little boy. <laughs> when he is a little boy. Well, you can't say that. It's just mental. We've just completely lost it. I'm not going to get into the politics. I said I wouldn't get into that, so I won't get into the politics. But we are right back there again, folks. And that is why we need to find our courage. I preached about courage in this church a couple of years ago. Do you know I did a study in the Bible about courage? And I discovered this. God doesn't give us courage. Oh, I know I've got your attention there. I'm not going to preach on this today, but he doesn't. In fact, what he says over and over and over again is be strong and very courageous. Be strong and be of good courage. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. He expects courage from us. Amen. And courage comes from faith. Yes, it's all connected. But courage is something that God has put in us. And we need to find our courage. These men had courage. They had great courage. So our covenant forefathers would rejoice with those who love the Lord Jesus and desire to reach Scotland with the gospel. So let's go on and look at what these men and what these women actually believed. What did they believe? As we move on to the subject of what the covenanters believed and what motivated them, I believe one verse sums up their life's pursuit and it's Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives even unto the death. They were sold out, sold out for Jesus and for his word. 
What did the covenanters believe? What did they believe about the Bible? Well, Psalm 119 verses 1 to 16 give us, you know, I have hidden your word in, your, in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've got, and again, I emphasize, I taught this over an entire weekend, so I'm skipping through things and just kind of paraphrasing and giving little snippets here. In Ephesians 6, 17, we read about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In John 17, 16 to 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. Your Word is truth. It doesn't have the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. God's word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is alive and living. In 2 Timothy 3, it talks about being stewards of the word because it's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in the righteousness. In 1 Peter 1, it says, we've been born again by the imperishable seed of the word of God. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot get saved unless you hear, believe, and receive the word of God. It's the seed that goes into the heart that germinates a new life by faith. So if we stop preaching it, people will not get saved. It's impossible. And yes, our testimony can draw people, give us a platform, but still we need to share the gospel. Amen. It's living and active and sharper. Seeds have the power to germinate within them. All we have to do is sow that seed. These men sowed the seed. And remember, the King James Bible did not come into completion until 1611. So they had little bits of like the Wycliffe copies, which he had copied from the Serpugent, and I won't get into the whole history of all of that. But they weren't perfect copies, but they had copies they had bits and pieces. The Bible was more precious than gold and silver and diamonds in this nation at that time. They cherished it, but it was also a crime to own it in the vernacular language. I had times when I was in Russia, we had to, when we did our outreaches, I had to hide the Bibles until the end because if we brought them out, I wouldn't even get a chance to speak because they absolutely flooded us. And how many Bibles do we have on our shelves? I don't know how many versions I've got. I'm giving many of them away. I've been getting them off the shelves and getting them out there. The word of God. These men honored, they revered, they loved the word of God. How often do you read your Bible? How often do you put it into practice? This is the most important thing in our lives. To read God's word. Give us this day our daily bread. We sang it just earlier on. This book will change your life. It changed my life and it will change your life. And I remember hearing a story, oh, I can't even, I had so many stories I want to tell, but I don't have time to tell it. It was years and years ago when the Iron Curtain was, was happening, there was, a, there was a chap, he'd moved to America when he was just a, a child, he spoke Russian, he was Russian, and he, he managed in the 60s to get a trip over the Sam, Siberian um, uh, train, and he had his own Bible there, and it was in Russian. And he read it in Russian. And he was sitting in the cubicle and there was a guy opposite him who saw it, who hated him. He was a military man. He was throwing daggers at him and everything. And uh, he would smile at him. And, and then at one point, he went to the toilet. He came back. And as he came back, the guy opposite him had a big grin in his face. And as he looked, the window was open. And he looked down, his Bible had gone. Throwing the Bible out the window. But he didn't lose it. He just sat and he went through his trip, praying throughout as he went throughout the whole side. Years and years later, when Russia opened in the, the early 90s, he went there as a missionary. And he went to Siberia in a missionary. When he got to a particular town, he was talking. He said, there's so many people here saved. What's happened to you? What's going on? He said, oh, you'll never believe it. He said, what? Well, tell us what happened. He said, I'll tell, take you to the past. Took him to the pastor. And the pastor said, well, I was out one day in the fields working. He said, my gran had told me all about Jesus. Didn't believe, didn't do anything. And I said, God, if you're real, if you exist, you're going to have to show me. And he said, the next minute, this train went past and bump, I got hit in the back of the head. He said, I looked down and he said, it was a Bible in Russian in my own language. And this man said, well, can I see it? Can I see it? There was hardly any of it left. 
He said, that's my Bible. Oh, hallelujah. God's word is powerful, living, active. One Bible changed an entire community. One scripture from Luther, the just shall live by faith, changed the whole direction of the church. I must move on. It's time. They lived and died for the testimony of the word of God. It's time that we found our backbone and trusted God, had guts and had courage. Second thing about the covenant, the covenant, they, they had a covenant with God. In 1 Samuel 18, we hear about David having a covenant with Jonathan. We read the verses in 1 Corinthians 11. I just taught, you know, when you take communion, I just taught about communion in a church in Nairn just last week, and they asked me to do a wee condensed teaching of it and send it to them, which I did just yesterday morning or the morning before. Eight things I found that we do when we take communion. I'm not going to go down there. I'd love to, but I can't. But covenant, when it's a binding agreement between two people. And I'm not going to go into the covenant and all that. Oh, oh, I'd love to, and I'm not as qualified as the likes of Merv Milner, even Arthur, to talk about the covenant. But the one thing I do know is this, is that you and I are not in covenant with God. I've got your attention there, haven't you? But Jesus is in covenant with his Father, and because we are in Christ Jesus, we are in the covenant in him, and therefore we have access to all the blessings. Do you know why that's important? Because it was, if it was about us and him, every time we sin, we'd be out, we'd be in, we'd be out, we'd be in. And a lot of people live a yo-yo Christian life because that's what they believe. It isn't. About, I'm not advocating we sin deliberately or anything. But our, our security is in Christ Jesus. This is all about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Christ Jesus. And that wonderful covenant is because of what he did for us, what he's doing for us, and what he's going to do for us. That's where our security, our faith, and our strength lies. These men, these covenanters knew that. They absolutely knew it. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. All things are passed away and behold, all will become new. If you want to know more about that, come tomorrow morning because I'm preaching on a little bit of that in the morning tomorrow at the service here. When an Israeli took a covenant with another Israeli, they would go through these nine particular things. They would exchange coats saying that they were giving themselves to one another in loyalty. They would exchange belts where they had their armor and their sword. They were exchanging. They would protect one another. They would cut the covenant. They'd make a scar. They'd make vows before each other. They'd make a scar to remind them of the covenant. They'd mingle the blood. That's the origin of blood brothers. It's the origin of a shaking hands. They would exchange names. A sinner becomes a Christian, a saint. They'd make covenant terms, which we have in our Bible today. They'd eat a memorial meal, which is our communion. And then they would normally plant a memorial, which would, know, would normally be a tree. We have the cross that has stood for millennium to remind us of the covenant that Jesus ratified with his Father. And when, to those, the Bible says this, right? In John chapter 1. To those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. When you are born of God through repentance and faith and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, you become in Christ Jesus. And when you're in Christ Jesus, he is your life. He is the covenant. It's all about him. So they formulated this covenant. A lot of it was to do about Presbyterian worship. We won't go into that. But the heart and soul of it was the supremacy and the absolute headship of Jesus as the head of the church. That the Bible was God's word, the final and absolute authority on all life and conduct and also on all matters of church decisions and Government Within months, over 300,000 people were covenanted with God and signed it, many in their own blood. And remember, Scotland was a lot smaller then as well. 300,000. 
And you know what happened? Ministers were ousted from their parishes. They were kicked out. They were pursued. They were killed. They were murdered. They were, homes were taken away. Their lands were taken away. Laws were passed forbidding preaching. Uh, preaching. Conventicles in the fields and the hills became common. Great and small, rich and poor, all were persecuted, hunted, imprisoned, fire, uh, fined, executed. And that leads me on to the third subject of what they believed in, the church. And think about the church for a moment. What's our situation in the church today? Political correctness, the sanctioning of gay ministers and the complete eroding of the marriage covenant in itself, pluralism, worldliness, all the seeker-friendly stuff and you know, all the stuff that we have in our society now, God is now seeking out a people who will love him, who will love his word, who will fear him, fear his word, trust him, trust his word, and obey him. And we're right back in history again. Maybe not episcopy as it was then, which was a very, very subtle form of a Catholicism that was going on at the time. Not imprisonment, maybe not death, not yet anyway, but who knows what's around the corner. We have apostate religion in our society. I was going to say church, but I'm not going to use the word church because Jesus said, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He knows those who are his. Nationwide ministers have had to leave their parishes and form other meeting and homes and small groups. I travel the country. I'm on the road 60, 70% of my time, the length and breadth of Scotland. And I meet these people some of them have lost their livelihood, but they've started new fellowships and God's hands come upon them to bless them. The church, Jesus said, I am building my church. But what is the church? Who owns the church? The covenanters stood against religion's form, religious ceremony, superstition, hierarchy, and the way it became so, not just politicalized, but it became so corrupt so corrupt. I remember on one of my trips I was going to Shetland, my friend sent me a link the day before I was going and when I opened the link it was 28 churches in the Shetlands closed. It just happened that day. So I arrived in the Shetlands and, and there was no consultation with the local ministers or anything. They just shut down 28 churches. And I arrived in Shetland thinking, oh my goodness. And of course your first reaction is, oh, isn't that sad and that terrible? But you know what it did? It framed a conversation because when I got there, people were saying, well, actually, you know, they didn't close 28 churches. They closed 28 buildings. Hello. <laughs> Hello. They closed 28 buildings. They didn't close 28 churches. And the conversation became, what is church? It's the people of God. It's us gathering together, those born again of the Spirit of God. Some of those churches were bought by independent little groups that formed their own fellowships, sold out for Jesus, loved the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I came into Shetland in the middle of that conversation. It was a great opportunity for an evangelist. Great conversations and times to seek about God's church. Jesus said, my church my church. This is his church. You're part of his church. I know we say, oh yeah, I'm part of this, that, or that fellowship, but actually we are part of his church. And Jesus said, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ, and we have to remain faithful to him. I remember Bob Viner, who these study books, I worked with a guy called Bob Viner in Russia, one of the most amazing evangelists I've ever met in my life, and I've met quite a few. And I remember him saying, he would always say in his meeting, if you were going to get married to a woman, and she said to you, look, I love you, I'm sold out to you, but so 364 days of the year, I'm going to be faithful to you, but one day I'm just going to go and I'm going to sleep with someone else and have myself a, a bit of a good time. Would you marry that person? No, and vice versa, would you? Of course you wouldn't. Faithfulness to Jesus, faithfulness to him. The church is not a building. There were no buildings left for them. They met in conventicles, outdoor meetings. Do you know there was a law passed in Scotland where it said nowhere on the Scottish land can you meet together for um, Christian purposes? And you know what happened? I can't remember where it was. Some of you will probably know, maybe my, my friends here. 
But there was a loch somewhere where they used to get in a boat and they went out into the middle of the loch and they'd have a service on the boat in the middle of the loch and, and the dragoons could do nothing about it because it wasn't on the land. And then they'd come back and they'd go away and then the guys would get on the boat and then they'd go into the thing and, they would have, and, it, and it worked for them because strictly by the law, when you live by the law, you have to obey the law. When you live by the grace of God, there's forgiveness and mercy and empowerment and equipping from God, Amen. Hallelujah. They banned him from meeting. I know I, I have a dear friend of mine, sorry I name dropped him, but he's a dear friend of ours. I haven't seen him for years, but Angus Buchan from the Faith Like Potatoes fame. We knew Angus, he stayed with us, we worked with him, and, and he's a lovely man of God. And uh, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. What was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you digress. You go on to all sorts of uh, things. Anyway, I'll, I'll never mind. I'll skip that. It will come back to me if it was relevant. If it was relevant. Church is the people of God. It's the people of God. He is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not prevail against it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Got it. He was due to meet in Gala Shields a number of years ago. The church meets in a public meeting. They were banned because it was a public council building. He couldn't have it. He phoned my friend, Sandy Jameson, down in Dumfries, and he had it there instead last minute. There's a funny story about that. If you want to ask me over lunch, I'll tell you about that story. I ended up on the news that night. But anyway, never mind about that. I remember hearing about a Church of Scotland minister, Maggie Lane, I think her name was. She had an experience where apparently she died and she went and met the Lord. Some of you might have seen her, heard her. I saw her at a PWAM thing. I believe, I know these things are difficult for her to get her head around, but I believe that she had a genuine experience. And I remember getting a video from my friend um, Norman Wright in Dunoon. He gave me this video of a meeting that she had. And she was telling the story about how she met the Lord and he was, she was about to come back. And she turned to the Lord and said to him, Lord, what do you want me to tell the people when I go back? And I remember this specifically in the video, her face changed. And this serious look came on her, on her face because it, this was, you know, in the video when she was retelling the story. She said, the Lord spoke to me and said, you go back and tell my people, I want my church back. <sighs> I felt a shiver go up my spine when I saw, I want my church back. God wants his church back. And church is when you meet with your friends around a kitchen table or a house group or a home group or a big mega place or gathering here. This is church, folks. Amen. The gathering with people. Then prayer. Acts 2, 42 and 47 tells about they met together and they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching to prayer, to the breaking of bread, all these things. But they were devoted to prayer. Prayer was a lifestyle, not a really a weekly meeting for these people. They say of Robert Murray McShane, although he was, he was 27 or something when he died, and he did only ministry for about eight or nine years, they said that before he went in the pulpit, as he went up, and he, there was a visible aura around him because he spent so much time in the presence of God. And when he spoke, people listened. It was like honey. Because he'd been with Jesus. He'd been with Jesus. The testimony of the martyrs, their faith, their prayer. Many of them, which we're going to see later on in the session this afternoon. Many of them, their last action was prayer. On the gibbet. Or before they were about to be burned. Or before they were about to be hung. Or before they were about to be shot. They would pray. They would pray. They would pray. They believed in prayer. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Seek first the kingdom of God, the Bible says, and everything else will be given unto you. So they believed ardently in God's word. They believed in the covenant. They knew the covenant. They believed in the church and as being the body of Christ and they had such a passion and a heart for prayer. But what motivated them was passion for Jesus. In Revelation, we read a, a rebuke about um, one of the churches who said, yeah, you've done this, you do that, well done, tick for that, tick that box, tick that box. But this one thing you lack, you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten your first love. You've left your first love. These people loved 
Jesus with a passion. The word passion from Strong's, it means a strong emotion, a feeling, strong enthusiasm. In Russia, I lived on a, t- on a, a street in Russia. It was called Ulitsa Entusiastov. That's where my wife and I lived when we first went out there in 1990. Ulitsa Entusiastov. And my translator, who became my right-hand man, he was almost attached. We were like Siamese twins. We went everywhere together. He said to me, do you realize that Entusiastov means with godly zeal? Enthusiasm, the word enthusiasm. You know how sometimes, oh, him, oh, he's so enthusiastic, you know. Hallelujah! Praise God that he is. Because the real, the real meaning of the word is with godly zeal and godly passion. These people had a passion for Jesus. I remember preaching in a, a town which was called the Atomic City. I wasn't supposed to be there. They sneaked me in because it was where they do all the research and Westerners were not meant to be there. And there was this guy who was, when, before the meeting started, he was so antagonistic, so in my face. I, I got a chance, I preached the gospel, I shared the message, I gave the altar call, and he was one of the first that came. And he gave his life to Jesus, and at the end he was waiting to speak to me, and I finally got to him. And I looked at him, I was so delighted, his face had changed and everything. I said, well, what happened to you? He said, I'll tell you what happened to me. He said, I heard what you said, and I heard the gospel from your lips, but I saw the reality of the gospel from the passion in which you shared it. If you and I can't be passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're wasting our time. Amen. Sorry, I'm just throwing some things out there in the midst of this for us to consider and to chew upon. They had a passion for Jesus, a passion. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Three things you can do, put our fingers in our ears and ignore them. Or we can open the door, see who it is and say, no, thank you, close the door and get about our normal business. Or we can open the door, see who it is and say, oh, wow, Lord, it's you, come in. What are you going to do today? When you've heard and experienced what God's going to say through these men here and what he's going to say to you is corporately an individual, what are you going to do? Are you going to put your hands in your ears? Or are you going to... Say, oh yeah, I get that. Oh, that was interesting. That was really good. But not just now, Lord. Or are you going to say, oh Lord, come in. Let's go. Let's do this together. I pray to God that will be the third. That you'll open the door to your life and let him come. The covenanters love Jesus. Their motto, it's all over PWAM Center. For Christ and his covenant. For Christ and his covenant. The cost them many of their lives. They overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their life even at the death. They had a passion for Jesus. But they also had a passion for the gospel. They had a passion for the gospel. You know, the Bible says that Paul said, when I came to you, I preached to you of first importance. Above everything he taught, and he gave us a third of the New Testament. He said, this is the most important, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, folks. The gospel isn't Jesus loves you. The gospel, dare I say it, to upset the apple cart this morning, the gospel isn't God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Paul said the gospel is this. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And yes, when we repent and believe, we will get new life gospel. It's simple. My friend, I've quoted it. I keep quoting it. My friend, Roly Johnson, always says to me, Malcolm, remember, the power of the gospel is in its simplicity. The power of the gospel is in its simplicity. It's not rocket science, folks. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which I preach everywhere, I've preached it in this church, about being messengers, ministers, and emissaries. We're called to be messengers, preaching the gospel, ministers, bringing the power of God to the people, and emissaries in the way we live our lives. And we need to just come to the Lord and ask him to forgive us for fear of sharing the good news of the gospel. And the modern gospel often is diluted. It's non-confrontational. It's no mention of sin, no mention of repentance. I was in a meeting quite recently and I was looking through some tracks and there were great tracks, but the one thing that was missing, there was nothing about repentance in the tracks. And yet the Bible says that these are the foundations of the Hebrews 6. Repentance from dead works, faith towards God, baptisms, etc., etc., Repentance from dead works. First message Jesus ever recorded is preaching. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Then come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He preached it. The disciples preached it. We are to preach it as well. 
They love God. They love the gospel. And because these two things were key essentials in their lives, the third thing that, that impassioned them, they had a passion for souls. They had a passion for Scotland. Psalm 2 verse 8 says this, Ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. Paul wrote this, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel because I am obligated to preach the gospel. And John Knox, one of the most famous Christians in our nation, said, give me Scotland or I die. These men and women loved God. They loved the gospel. They loved people. They loved the Lord of God with all the heart. They loved their neighbor as themselves, as Jesus instructed us. Maybe it's partly due to the national government. Maybe they heard from God, feared from God, but many of them prophesied about our nation. And I'm going to be bringing those prophecies at the end of the session this afternoon. I really do encourage you, be there for that. Because many of these prophecies were prophesied as they were giving their last breath in martyrdom. And they prophesied about this nation. And we're going to close on that with what I bring. We'll be closing on my sessions with that. There was a passion for Scotland. There was a passion for souls. Absolute passion. Leonard Ravenhill tells a story of one of the last men who were sent to death row in our country. He was a murderer and the minister went to go and appeal to him, not last rites, but give him an opportunity to repent and get saved. And he shared the gospel with this man. And this is what he said. He said, I don't believe it. It can't be true. And the minister appealed to me and said, it is. That's the truth of the gospel. That Jesus died for your sins. That he was buried and he rose from the dead and he'll give you new life. He'll give you abundant life. Give you eternal life. If you'd repent and believe. He said, I can't believe it. And this is what he said. He said, if I were a minister of this gospel, I would crawl on my hands and knees the length and breadth of this nation over broken glass just to, st to tell one person about Jesus Christ. Just to tell one person. Let God awaken us today to the reality of what we... He told a parable and said, does not the shepherd leave the 99 safe to go and find the lost? So let me tell you, my daughter went to Malawi a number of years ago and I looked up Malawi. I wanted to find out a reputable conservative um, a statistical w website and it told me that between 25 and 40% of Malawi were genuinely born again. I was amazed. I thought, that's fantastic. What does it say about Scotland? I looked and it said between 5 and I think it was 8%. I was absolutely shocked. So... Moving on, several, maybe even years, I can't remember, I was preaching in a church in Dornach. Over lunch that day, I mentioned these statistics. The pastor said to me, I want to correct you about something that you said today. I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. And he said, uh, see, when you gave those statistics, he said, my preacher last week was from uh, the Fellowship of International Evangelical Churches. And he said, um, and I asked him, what do you do in your spare time? He said, I'm a Christian statistician. I do surveys for, for ministries, for churches, for all kinds of groups. And he said, I have just done a survey of Scotland. We took a representative group of people here in Scotland and we discovered that in Scotland, this was about five, six years ago, in Scotland, between one and 2% of Scotland are truly born again. At my AOG National Conference last year, my, the Scottish superintendent stood up and said, it was the Scottish uh, conference, sorry, last November, he said that statistics have just come out saying that um, less than, was it 7% of the United Kingdom go to church now? Go to church. Just less than a decade ago, those numbers would have been up to about maybe 17, 20%. We have a job to do, friends. These men had a passion for Jesus. They had a passion for the gospel. They had a passion for the people. Heaven or hell, life or death, with God or lost for eternity, eternal life or eternal fire. It's not a nice thought. It's not a nice thought. I get that. Not a popular subject. I think Jonathan Edwards had a desk sign on his desk in front of him and it said, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyelids. Stamp eternity on my eyelids. Eternity was stamped, hallmarked on the eyelids of Jonathan Edwards. 
and he saw it in a perspective of eternity. Do you know, this day today, God wants to do something amazing in all of our lives. By looking back, by seeing that the same spirit, the same gospel, the same Jesus, if we would come to him and ask him, Lord, fill us afresh, fill us anew, set my heart on fire again, fan into flame the gifts of God, bring back to memory the prophetic words, change my life again. We can change those statistics. Why? As the Bible says this, nothing, nothing is impossible for God. And I know it's terrible out there. I know what it's like out there. You know, Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, God haters, insolent, arrogant, proud, all of that stuff. I know that. But the Bible also says, where sin abounds, grace abounds in greater abundance. There's nothing that any government or group or movement or man or devil or Satan himself that can do out there where God doesn't have the remedy through the grace and the power of the Spirit and the goodness of his word and the, 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 the word of God and the fellowship of the saints and us working together as one to reach this nation for him. These men had such a passion. They believed the scriptures. They believed in the covenant. They believed in the church as being his church, not their church. He be they believed in prayer. And they were motivated by a passion for their personal relationship with Jesus, a passion for the gospel, which had come to them so graciously, and a passion to win the lost in this land around us. We are in the same position and at the same point in history today. And we can receive the same power and the same equipment. Amen. I'm going to pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you. We can look back. Lord, we don't want to live in the past. And we're not looking at the past so much here. We're looking at what these men, these women believed, how they lived, their passion, their motivation. Oh, God, may each and every one of us receive heavenly, divine empowerment and strengthening and equipping this very day as we go through this day. And Lord, may you seal these words and speak specific individual things in lives this morning, even in this first session. May you seal those words. May it not be stolen. I give no place for the enemy to come and steal. And Lord, may that word, living, active, sharp, change our lives. And not just our lives, but the lives of multitudes out there who need to know you and hear your gospel. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God.